Much like Shrek from the hit Broadway musical Shrek the Musical, Dead Rising has layers. On its face, Dead Rising is Dawn of the Dead the video game, not to be confused with the video game Dawn of the Dead the game. Peel back that top layer and you have a scathing critique of Western consumerism, giving us Spirited Away the video game. Peel back another layer and you have a critique of the way that the global poor are exploited in the interest of capital, making it Noam Chomsky the video game. Layers. This game belongs on the Mount Rushmore of zombie games, alongside Left 4 Dead, Black Ops, and whichever game is controversial enough to get you to leave a comment about how stupid I am. Maybe Dead Island. Does anyone remember Shadow of Rome? Probably not, because it was a commercial failure. After poor sales, especially in North America, Capcom cancelled the series, and the already underdevelopment sequel was retooled to be more appealing to an American audience. What's the most quintessential American location possible? Apparently it's Breezewood, Pennsylvania, but after that, it's shopping malls. Where else can you get a massage, a katana, and Cinnabon all at the same place? Fuck Mount Rushmore and this big statue of Ben Franklin, the real American monuments are shopping malls. Capcom recognized this, and from the ashes of Shadow of Rome, Dead Rising was born. The primary game mode, 72 hour mode, opens with freelance photojournalist Frank West riding in a chartered helicopter with pilot Ed DeLuca. Frank reveals that he's researching a story, working on an anonymous tip that something big is happening in the middle of nowhere town of Willamette, Colorado. Through his camera lens, Frank spots a military blockade of the road into the city, providing confirmation that chartering a helicopter was the correct choice. Wanting to get shots of the city before the National Guard ropes off the town, Frank asks Ed to fly the helicopter over Main Street. The next sequence is an introduction to the game's photography mechanic. As a photojournalist, Frank is equipped with a camera which you can use to capture pictures of things that you see throughout the game. After taking your first picture, you'll be awarded Prestige, which is Dead Rising's equivalent of experience points. I'll talk more about both Prestige and photography later. For now, there are four events worth photographing. The man on top of a car, the surrounded school bus, the gas station explosion, and the woman cornered on the roof. After documenting Main Street, Frank asks Ed to drop him off on top of the mall and reminds Ed to return for him in three days. While approaching, the helicopter is intercepted by the military. Ed manages to outmaneuver the military aircrafts and hover over the helipad, giving Frank the chance to leap from the helicopter and onto the mall's rooftop. On the rooftop, Frank meets Carlito. Hello there. Huh? You're the reporter, aren't you? Yeah, no. You came alone? Yeah, I'm freelance. You know, go on the battlefield alone, no crew. So, uh, what's going on around here anyway? You came by helicopter, didn't you? What did you see from the sky? Well... If it were just a riot, I doubt the military would quarantine the entire area. The moratorium on information getting out is a little extreme, in my opinion. There's, uh, something else I can't put my finger on. Doesn't sound like civil disobedience. It's too quiet. <laughs> Almost as if everyone's already dead. Yeah. So why don't you just tell me already? What's going on? I think you'd better see for yourself. This, my friend, is hell. The player now takes control of Frank for the first time. Stepping inside of the mall places Frank in the security room. This is an important location, one that you'll frequently return to throughout the game. For now, there's not much more to do here than watch an optional cutscene and to save the game. Dead Rising's save system was pretty universally hated, sometimes fairly, sometimes not so much. To many critics, including myself, 
the fact that you are only allowed one save slot per Xbox profile is ridiculous. You can only have one active playthrough, and if you want to start over, you have to do it from the beginning of the game. You do get to keep your level and stats between playthroughs, which is a system that I like a lot, but it doesn't excuse the single save slot. Fortunately, the PC release fixed this problem by letting you create multiple profiles. You still only get one save slot per profile, and stats are still profile specific, but multiple profiles fixes the bulk of the problem here. The other point often criticized is the fact that you can only save in beds and bathrooms. I can see how it might be a bit frustrating if there's a skill issue causing you to die frequently and feel like you're losing progress, but even then, it's not like this game has Dark Souls style boss runs that you have to contend with. That would be kind of a self-correcting problem anyway because, like I said before, you get to keep your level and stats when you start your next playthrough. To be totally fair, I saw this criticism leveled most frequently in the years following Dead Rising's release, when save points were still seen as an artifact of technological limitations. In more recent years, AAA games have brought this concept back into vogue, so it's probably not as unpopular as it used to be. Frank heads into the mall proper, where he finds a group of survivors barricading the entrance doors. Descending from the second floor, Frank is accosted by an older woman, Lindsay Harris, who has lost her dog. Frank brushes Lindsay off before moving to approach a younger woman, but before Frank can reach her, a man grabs Frank's attention, admonishing him for ogling pretty girls with the threat of zombies literally knocking at the door. Frank is enlisted to help reinforce the barricade with whatever supplies can be scavenged. There isn't much to do at this point beyond eavesdropping and taking pictures of survivors, so you'll pretty quickly find yourself moving towards the pile of junk to help with the barricade. Before Frank can pick anything up, he spots an elderly man on the other side of a mole gate. He readies his camera to photograph the man, who reacts angrily. The man accuses Frank of summoning him here and demands to know Frank's plans. When the old man realizes that he is mistaken and that Frank had nothing to do with any of this, he storms off, leaving Frank confused. While Frank watches the old man's departure, Lindsay finds Madonna in the worst place possible, the mall's entryway, amidst a horde of zombies. She doesn't think, she just acts, pulling down the survivor erected barricades to reach the doors. Zombies flood into the mall. From the second floor, a man urges survivors to run, beckoning them towards the staircase. Once again, the player takes control and this time, hell has broken loose. Between you and the staircase is a horde of zombies and a handful of doomed survivors. On reaching the staircase, the scene cuts to Frank entering the security room, where survivors have already begun to congregate, including the man from the second floor. Seeing that Frank is alone, the man asks where the other survivors are. When Frank cannot confirm their survival, the man signals to another survivor to weld the door shut, ensuring that the zombies cannot gain entry to the security room. The man then opens the air duct, declaring it to be their only way into and out of the rest of the mall, before crawling in. One of the remaining survivors starts a conversation with Frank. Frank shows her a few of his photographs, and she seems to take a particular interest in the picture of the elderly man. The woman introduces herself as Jesse, and she says that the man from earlier is Brad. She ends the conversation by letting Frank know that that's all the more that she's authorized to say. When the cutscene ends, you find yourself back in the security room. Otis, a mall security guard, gives you a map and a transceiver, which is essentially a walkie-talkie. Emerging from the air duct, Frank finds himself back on the mall's rooftop, where he encounters an older man, Jeff. Jeff is distraught, having been separated from his wife in the chaos. This is the introduction to the game's survivor system. Speaking with a survivor will usually cause them to join your party, though some survivors have small requirements that must be satisfied before joining you. Your goal is to lead as many survivors as possible back to the safety of the security room. I'll talk about survivors a little more extensively later, but for now, I'll just say that they are an excellent but deeply flawed addition to this game. Jeff joins you, but before leading him to safety, it's worthwhile to take him to the other side of the rooftop, where you can find his wife, Natalie. Jeff and Natalie embrace spawning yellow icons hovering over their heads. These icons indicate photo opportunities, and they appear frequently throughout the game. Taking a well-timed photo of the opportunity provides a huge amount of prestige, which again, is the equivalent to experience points. The game abbreviates prestige points as PP. I won't be calling it that. Effectively, prestige can be earned in five different ways. 
completing missions referred to as scoops and cases, rescuing survivors, taking photographs, killing enemies, and performing bonus actions. The prestige gauge is located in the top left corner of the screen, just under Frank's life bar. The gauge indicates how far Frank is from leveling up, as well as his current level. At this point, Frank is a weak, feeble man, basically an invalid, but with each level comes a stat increase or skill learned. Frank has five stats, health, inventory space, attack power, throwing distance, and movement speed. At level 50, which is the level cap, Frank is a capable zombie slayer, but at level one, venturing into the mall is truly perilous, so the progression feels rewarding. I have only two complaints. The movement speed at the beginning of the game is painfully slow, and throwing is a borderline useless ability, so every level that increases your throwing distance is a disappointment. There are also skills to be learned through leveling, 24 of them in all. Some of the skills are extremely useful. The knee drop, for example, is an attack, but it also negates fall damage, so it's a staple. Most of the skills don't have much practical use, but they're conceptually hilarious. Snap your picture of the reunited couple and lead them back to the security room, at which point you'll be notified that you've completed an escort and you've received a ton of prestige. Escorted survivors will populate the security room, meaning you can visually measure your progress as you move through the game. Back on the rooftop, you have two paths into the mall. Virgins will take the elevator, Chads will take the back door. Self-select into your appropriate category and make your way into the warehouse. The warehouse itself isn't interesting, it's simply the way into the mall proper. Honestly, the air duct probably could have led directly here. I don't really understand why the rooftop is necessary. Anyway. Zombies, huh? Had a feeling you'd show up. You! Look, don't sneak up on me. <sighs> Brad was attacked. I located him on the monitor. Ugh. It's probably just a sprain. I've got to help Brad, or he's done for. All right, fine. Give me your gun. Come on, I'm the reason you just got hurt. Let me help. No, I can't let a civilian do that. That's against regulations. Yeah, well, I don't think they had zombie-infested malls in mind when they wrote those regulations, kid. You know how to use this? Kinda. I've covered wars, you know. Look, after I'm through helping you, you and I are going to have a nice little chat. Finally, we're given mostly free reign over the mall, and zombies are everywhere. There are a few different types of zombies with varying levels of strength, speed, and health, but I only learned this when I was researching the game. While playing, they all feel equally easy to chew through. A counter in the corner of the screen indicates how many zombies you've killed, and each thousand kills nets a nice prestige bonus. Naturally, with lots of zombies to kill, Dead Rising gives you lots of options for killing. The absurd weapon variety in this game is kind of the calling card. Lead pipe, electric guitar, shopping cart, bowling ball, chainsaw. If it's not nailed to the floor, it's a weapon. It's impossible to overstate how cool this is. Once you've played through the game a couple of times, it loses its shine, but I vividly remember exactly how exciting this was during my first playthrough. Weapons have a hidden durability stat, meaning that they can only be used X number of times before they break. When a weapon nears its breaking point, its inventory icon will start to flash. Durability is a good mechanic, introducing an additional consideration that you have to balance against your other priorities. It very much adds to the surviving a zombie outbreak feel. A lot of weapons are nearly or entirely useless, which is a nice touch as well. What good will wielding a coat hanger do during a zombie outbreak? What about a novelty mask? Oversized stuffed bear? Capcom knew that the players wouldn't really use these, but the fact that the player has the option to use them makes the game feel so much bigger. Humorously, at least to me, is the fact that you can find legitimate weapons hidden throughout the mall. In Paradise Plaza, for example, there's a katana sitting on top of an awning next to the coffee shop, and an Uzi on the platform above the warehouse entrance. 
Now, when you think of going to the mall in real life, you probably only think about weapon availability like half the time. The other half the time, you're probably thinking about clothes shopping. Dead Rising delivers on that front, too. Each clothing store has a unique outfit that you can try on, and with no one around to judge you, you're free to let your true self shine through. Bonus points, there are no sales associates, so you can browse uninterrupted. It's honestly a superior customer experience to the real thing. Checking your watch will let you see your available missions, called scoops, as well as the in-game time. The amount of time remaining until Ed returns with the helicopter is displayed across the screen each time you load a new cell. Game time passes at 12 times normal speed, so the game's 72 hour length passes in 6 real hours. At this point, your only scoop is backup for Brad, so to do that, you'll have to leave Paradise Plaza and enter Leisure Park. Like pretty much all of this mall, Leisure Park is way too nice for a mall in a town of 53,000 people, but whatever. There's not much to say about Leisure Park right now, but there will be later. For now, I guess there's a clock tower and a pond and this stuff and whatever. The food court is reached via the park. Your, uh, girlfriend sent me to find you. Who? Jesse? Damn it! Okay, we'll have to talk about this later. You know how to use that gun? I've never fired at a person. All right, I'll cover you from here. You need to stick to the shadows. Try to get close to the target, okay? And what am I supposed to do when I get close? Well, the best solution would be to shoot the guy. But if you can't do that, keep him busy dodging your bullets and stay out of trouble. Are you up to it? I'm a lot better with a camera. But yeah, I'll give it a shot. All right. Next time he reloads, I'll lay down a suppressing fire. I'm counting on you. Make your way over there. One, two, three! Now is the perfect time to talk about how guns work in this game. They don't work. Capcom took the gunplay from Dead Rising's sister game, Resident Evil 4, and then made it slightly worse before forcing it into the game here. Mechanically, the gunplay can be divided into two categories, hip firing and ADS. When firing from the hip, you can't control what Frank shoots at, you can only make suggestions. Essentially, hip firing means that Frank will shoot at whichever enemy is closest to the direction that he's pointing. It's an awful system. Clearly, Capcom did not want ADS gunplay to upstage the hip firing, so they made that awful too. When aiming down the sights, Frank is unable to move, meaning in order to use a gun, Frank has to stand perfectly still. Aiming is slow and unresponsive, making guns almost entirely non-viable. Maybe that was the point. Maybe Capcom wanted to encourage players to use the variety of weapons found throughout the mall, but if that was the goal here, why even bother including guns in the first place? Needless to say, the terrible gunplay makes gunfights very unfun. Here's how it seems like you're meant to fight Carlito. You take a few pot shots at him, each one knocking off a tiny sliver of his health. He returns fire with his full auto, knocking off a huge amount of yours. You repeat this song and dance a few times until you die, and then you do the same thing over and over until you're leveled up to the point that you can tank the fight. Here's the actual way to fight Carlito. Find a katana, drink a quick step, and then fuck him up. I'll talk more about quick step in just a second. With Carlito's health depleted, he flees, riding an escape rope through a hatch in the ceiling. With the threat gone, Frank demands an explanation from Brad, who refuses. Thinking quickly, Frank reveals the picture of the elderly man that Jesse found interesting, offering information on the man in exchange for information from Brad. Though Brad is hesitant, he ultimately agrees, revealing that he and Jesse are DHS agents, and that they're looking for the man in the picture, Dr. Barnaby. 
Frank shares that the picture was taken in the entrance plaza, and the duo make their way there. Frank is now free to explore the food court. It's a mall food court. I don't really have much more to say about it. There's restaurants, there's food, there's an Uzi. Pretty standard fare. Now, food is the mechanism through which the player can restore Frank's lost health. Different items restore different amounts of health, so you need to be aware of which food is worth acquiring. If you're only down a little health, you can eat chips. If you're down a lot, you can eat steak. If you think my videos are terrible, you can eat my ass. And you're right. As a general rule of thumb, snacks restore the least health, beverages restore the most. Mixed drinks in particular are the best healing item. Throughout the mall are a handful of blenders. Frank can use the blenders to combine food items and create mixed drinks, which restore a ton of health and provide a special skill or buff to Frank for a short period of time. There are seven mixed drinks that can be made. The randomizer, which makes Frank sick, the energizer, which prevents Frank from taking damage, Quick Step, which greatly increases Frank's movement speed. Spitfire, which turns Frank's spit into a weapon. Oh yeah, Frank can spit. Untouchable, which prevents Frank from being grabbed by zombies. Zombate, which attracts zombies. And Nectar, which attracts queen wasps. I'll talk more about those later. The Transceiver might be the most infuriating mechanic in this game. Periodically, Frank receives calls from Otis on the Transceiver providing updates about things that he sees on the security cameras. Generally, answering the call assigns a mission to save one or more survivors, which the game calls scoops. I won't talk about most of the game's scoops, but I will cover a few of them. Now, here's the problem with the transceiver. When Frank answers a call, he cannot do anything other than move until the call is over. No attacking, no defending yourself, no using any items, and no skipping dialogue. You have to wait out the end of the call while avoiding zombies. And god forbid a zombie does get you. If Frank gets hit while talking to Otis, the call will immediately end, only for Otis to call back and restart the entire conversation from the very beginning. Even more frustrating, the first thing that he says when you answer again is, don't hang up on me like that, it's rude. Anyway, Otis calls to tell you about a man carrying a camera, much like yourself, in Paradise Plaza. We'll come back to that, but for now, we'll follow Brad into Alfresca Plaza. Alfresca Plaza is an open air wing of the mall, by far the least important section. I might be wrong on this, but I think that this is actually the only time that you have to visit Alfresca Plaza in order to complete the story. The only noteworthy location here is the gym, Flexen, where you can run on the treadmills and wail on the punching bags for prestige bonuses. Frank and Brad move through Alfresca Plaza and into the entrance plaza. The gate was down, but Brad somehow knows the code to raise it. To this point, the entrance plaza would not have been available to visit, but now it's open. The pair find Dr. Barnaby barricaded inside of a bookstore. Brad attempts to coax Dr. Barnaby into following them, but he refuses. Until he is guaranteed safe passage, Dr. Barnaby will not be opening the gate to the bookstore. He slams the door shut on Brad. Back in the security room, Brad debriefs Jesse. With Barnaby refusing to leave the bookstore until help arrives, the agents need to get in contact with HQ. Unfortunately, Jesse finds that the signal is being blocked. Brad concludes that in order to get to Barnaby, they'll need to secure their own route out of the mall, at which point Frank offers the fact that he has an escape ride secured, that in three days, a helicopter will return to extract Frank. Brad, comfortable with that plan, returns to the mall to find three days worth of supplies, assigning Jesse to watch the security monitors. This brings the first case to an end. Okay, I said we'd come back to the man with the camera in Paradise Plaza, so let's do that now. Kent Swanson is insufferable. He's a photographer, in his mind the best to have ever lived, and thanks to his infinite generosity, he's decided to mentor Frank, kicking off a more in-depth photography tutorial than the one in the helicopter. I actually like this. The player learns more about the photography mechanic, the game gets to utilize the mechanic to make it feel a little more integrated into the gameplay, and we get this funny, don't you know who I am type dynamic between Frank and Kent. Usually, when you meet a survivor in the mall, you just escort them back to the security room, but Kent isn't interested in that. Kent's only concern is the art of photography. Kent asks Frank to take a picture of him while he takes a picture of Frank. Kind of a stupid request, but whatever. 
get a picture worth 500 prestige, and Kent will then demand that Frank take a picture of him striking his signature pose. Imagine unironically telling someone that you, a grown-up, have a signature pose. Snap one of those pictures worth 700 prestige, and Kent will challenge you to take an erotic picture worth 500 prestige. Oh yeah, photos can earn bonuses based on their genre, one of which is erotica. There are five genres, gory pictures are labeled horror, violent pictures are brutality, dramatic are drama, and humorous are outtakes. The last category is erotica for taking pictures of certain parts of the female anatomy. This game is hella misogynistic, which isn't surprising, but it is disappointing, especially because not once does the game recognize the unfiltered sexual charisma that is Frank West. Overall, photography is a really weird mechanic. I mean, its presence makes sense from a narrative perspective. Frank West is a photojournalist here to document the outbreak, but as a matter of ludology, it seems like a chicken or the egg question. Can you take pictures because Frank West is a photojournalist and that's what photojournalists do? Or is Frank West a photojournalist because it explains the photography mechanic? Put more simply, which did Capcom decide first? that Frank would be a photojournalist, or that the game would include photography. To me, it seems like the latter. Now, the zombies may be brain dead, but they're not the stupidest thing in the mall. By a long shot, that title goes to the survivors. Escorting survivors is like herding cats if the cats were all actively suicidal after losing all of their money in a crypto rug pull. The survivors are pathetic, almost entirely unwilling to use any weapon you give them but somehow fearlessly running directly into crowds of zombies, where they're immediately mauled. To make matters worse, their pathfinding is absolutely busted, so they often run in the opposite direction trying to figure out how to reach Frank. You can partially resolve this problem by commanding survivors to move to specific locations, but it's still only mildly better than castration. There are a few different types of survivors. There are normal, run-of-the-mill survivors, there are healthy but helpless survivors that must be carried or have their hand held. These are exclusively women because, again, this game is misogynistic. And then there are injured survivors that require carrying or a shoulder to lean on. Ironically, the injured survivors are the easiest to escort because carrying an injured survivor makes Frank immune to attacks while moving. If Frank's attacks damage a survivor too many times, that survivor may defect, becoming immediately and irreversibly hostile to Frank. Given how frequently survivors take collateral damage when being rescued, it isn't hard to accidentally cause a survivor to defect. Revisiting Leisure Park after a few hours will initiate a cutscene in which three convicts donning orange jumpsuits have escaped prison and somehow got a turret-equipped jeep into the park, which has no outside access. Whatever. The convicts kill a survivor and are now hostile to the player. Throughout the mall are a handful of survivors called psychopaths. Psychopaths, such as the convicts, are hostile to Frank and to other survivors. With high mobility and powerful attacks, psychopaths are significantly more dangerous than zombies. They provide a lot of flavor to the game, and their presence definitely improves the experience. I'll talk about most of the psychopaths over the course of this video. At 7 o'clock on the first night, a cutscene plays that shows the zombies become more active as night falls. What the game is trying and failing to communicate here is that each night, the zombies will become stronger, faster, and more aggressive. When you next enter the warehouse on the way to the security room, another cutscene plays. Zombies have made their way into the warehouse, and while assessing the situation, Frank is attacked by a wasp. He manages to swat the wasp out of the air and stomp on it, at which point all of the nearby zombies begin to convulse and drop dead. The wasp, as it turns out, was a zombie queen. Queens infect a number of zombies throughout the mall. If you kill a host, the queen will fly into the air, giving Frank the opportunity to capture and destroy it. Upon doing so, all zombies within a few meters will drop dead. Hosts can be identified by the fact that they don't attack Frank or move from their location. They just kind of do a potty dance in one place. Wonderland Plaza is next to the food court, on the opposite end of Alfresca Plaza. This is where the game really drops the pretense of being set in a small city mall. What with its roller coaster. You can ride the coaster for a prestige boost if you are so inclined. 
Otis sends you to check out the roller coaster, saying that it's running out of control. Investigating the coaster initiates the most infamous psychopath battle in the game. Adam is a tough fight. He has two chainsaws, which lop off huge chunks of Frank's health. He's insanely quick, and he has multiple ranged attacks. To make matters worse, if you attack him outside of a few specific windows, he'll block your attack with his chainsaws, breaking your weapon. For a newcomer, he's probably the hardest fight in the game, and his cutscene upon defeat is just as insane as his opening cutscene. Defeating Adam is one of the few things that seasoned players will do every playthrough because of the weapon that he drops, the small chainsaw. Most psychopaths leave behind a weapon when defeated, a weapon that respawns every time Frank re-enters the plaza, meaning an unlimited supply of some of the game's strongest weapons. The small chainsaw is the most coveted weapon in the game, with its insanely high damage and fast swing speed. Some nerd can fact check me on this in the comments, but I'm pretty sure that outside of the two achievement unlocked weapons, the small chainsaw does more damage than any other weapon in the game. The small chainsaw breaks after 80 hits, but you can increase that number with books. Much like mixed drinks, books provide buffs and special skills to Frank while they're in his inventory. Prestige buffs, increased health regeneration, skateboard tricks, there's a fairly wide variety of effects. The entertainment book, the engineering book, and the criminal biography book each triple the small chainsaw's durability. And these effects stack, so if you find all three, each small chainsaw will last for 2,160 hits, meaning you could probably get away with only using one weapon for the rest of the game. I suspect the fact that all three books affect the small chainsaw was an oversight, given the fact that it is arguably the best weapon in the game, but nowhere near the hardest one to acquire. Honestly, even if Adam didn't leave behind the chainsaw, it would still be worth defeating him because of Greg. Like Otis, Greg works as mall security. Adam forced him onto the roller coaster, and with you defeating Adam, Greg is now free. Greg shows you a shortcut through the mall, connecting the Wonderland Plaza ladies' room and the Paradise Plaza ladies' room. This is a huge time saver. On the far end of Wonderland Plaza is North Plaza, which is still under construction. It's got a few interesting locations, but they'll come up naturally throughout the course of this video, so I won't talk about them right now. Instead, I'll talk about a psychopath found in the North Plaza. Cletus. Cletus is a gun shop owner, and a royal pain in the ass, even for seasoned players. Cletus has a shotgun, which takes off a huge chunk of your health and blows you backwards. And even if you do get close enough to hit him with something, he'll grab you and throw you away from him. The cherry on top is that your reward for defeating him is just guns, which I've already established are basically useless. Don't be like Cletus. All my homies hate Cletus. The second case begins at 6am on day 2. On the monitor, Jesse spots Carlito dragging Dr. Barnaby out of the bookstore. According to Brad, if Carlito escapes with Barnaby, none of the DHS's questions will be answered. The gate to the entrance plaza is now open, 
and Frank and Brad make their way there. Brad narrowly saves Frank from being shot, after which Frank uses the zoom on his camera to spot the professor, tied up and dangling above a crowd of zombies. Frank and Brad resolve to save the professor. This fight can be annoying, but it's probably on the easier end of psychopath fights. Carlito's sniper launches you backwards and there isn't anywhere to take cover, but once you reach him, he goes down pretty quick, leading into another cutscene. I'll be fine. Just take care of the professor. Go! He's unconscious, but alive. Ah, damn! You all right? Yeah, but I'm not in any condition to carry him. Can you get him back to the security room? Sedatives taken effect. The professor won't be waking up anytime soon. I managed to stop the bleeding, but he's running a fever. He needs medicine. A fever? Medicine, huh? The pharmacy is inside of Sean's Food and Stuff, the grocery store in the North Plaza. As Frank prepares to open the pharmacy doors, he hears noise behind him. Investigating the source of the sound, Frank finds himself face to face with the supermarket manager, Steve Chapman. Vandalize my store, huh? Not on my watch. Someone's been hurt. I need medicine. Hurt? That's just what this bitch said when she came to vandalize my store. I don't take kindly to vandalism. I won't allow it. Listen to me, and listen good, partner. I don't allow vandalism in my store! Steve is an interesting but fairly easy fight, leading into another banger of a cutscene. My store. My... store! Who will run my store when I'm gone? <laughs> my store? My food? My sales? My... Customers? Have a nice day. Clean up! Register six! Ugh. Back in the land of the living, you're one tough cookie. Can you stand? 
Look, I, uh, I saw you at the entrance, yesterday. You needed medicine, too. Maybe we should work together. I don't need any help. You people don't know a thing. You're the ones who caused this nightmare. You ruined Santa Cabeza and started all this. At this point, Frank can grab the medicine and return to the safe room, ending the second case. The third case begins at 11 a.m. and is only a single cutscene. It's barely even worth mentioning. The summary is that Dr. Barnaby is old and a dick. At noon, you can meet back up with Kent. If you don't have an erotic picture worth 500 prestige, he'll laugh at you and walk away, never to be seen again. But if you do have such a picture, he'll challenge you to one final contest. Be here tomorrow at noon. We'll settle this. It's just vague enough of a challenge to be interesting. The next challenge that a player is likely to take on is a scoop called the Hatchet Man. Entering the North Plaza hardware store initiates the following cutscene. Name and rank, soldier! You can't tell me, can you, fella? Oh yeah, I know why. It's because you're Viet Cong. I'm right, aren't I? You are nothing but a filthy communist. Oh. Oh. You, son, are gonna tell me where the gorilla's hideout is. By the time I'm done beating information out of you, you are gonna be begging for death to come take you away. Cliff Hudson is a tough fight. He's fast, his machete hits hard, and he can pop into and out of the crawl space beneath the store at any time. Fellingham gives us this cutscene. <sighs> Cliff is, by far, the most sympathetic psychopath in the game. You ultimately feel bad for him, and you like Frank more for his gesture of closing Cliff's eyes after he finally dies. A little heavier than what I would expect from a zombie game. Back in Paradise Plaza, a group of men in raincoats are preparing to ritually sacrifice a woman locked in a box. When their leader notices you, the men attack. This is the true eye cult, a great addition to the game. After this cutscene, cultists will be found standing in groups throughout the mall. They can attack with their knives, as well as kamikaze-like suicide attacks. So they're more dangerous than zombies, but they also provide significantly more prestige when killed. The fourth case starts at 3 p.m. Frank spots Isabella on the security monitor outside of Sean's food and stuff. He sets off to find her and get answers. Frank arrives at Sean's to find her exiting the store, initiating another battle. This one is easy. She circles Frank on her motorcycle, offering ample time to hit her. After the fight, Frank pins her down and demands answers. She confesses that Carlito is her brother, and she agrees to bring him to meet Frank in an empty store at midnight, ending the fourth case. 
The fifth case begins with Frank waiting for the siblings. Isabella falls through the door, attacked by a zombie. Frank saves her, after which she tells Frank that Carlito shot her in a fit of rage. Frank decides to bring Isabella back to the security room. Outside of the empty store is Kindell Johnson, a smooth-talking, shotgun-wielding man in a tuxedo. Kindell is interesting because if you escort him to safety, he will later organize a mutiny, leading a number of survivors to their deaths if Frank doesn't intervene. Otis eventually calls to let Frank know that there are, quote, a bunch of freaks gathering in the movie theater. On entering the correct theater, Frank encounters the cult leader, Sean. Another reasonably hard battle ensues, but like everyone else, Sean cannot withstand the might of the small chainsaw. Pranks. I beseech thee! From this point forward, the cultists are gone from the game. Sean's sword is nice enough, but the real prize here is the Brainwashing Tips book, which makes survivors significantly more aggressive towards zombies. Dangerously close to being useful, I might say. The next psychopath that I want to talk about is Paul. Paul freaks me the fuck out. The thing about Paul is I don't really think he cracked after the zombies broke in. I think he's just like this. I am 100% certain that Paul smells like cat pee all of the time. Paul is unique and that he doesn't have to die after you defeat him. While he burns to death, you're free to grab a fire extinguisher and save his life. He then pinky promises that he'll behave, so you take him back to the security room. A short while later, Otis calls to let you know that Paul has a gift for you, which turns out to be a Molotov cocktail. It's not useful, but it's the thought that counts. In the security room, case seven begins. Exactly what is this last resort talk all about? Carlito said that he'd blow up the mall if he were cornered. <laughs> Damn, we've got a regular suicide bomber on our hands. It's then what you're thinking. The explosion would send parasitic larvae into the atmosphere. He plans to spread zombies outside of the city? Is he insane? If that bomb goes off, there'll be nowhere to run. The zombies will be everywhere. <sighs> He's planning to flood the area underneath the mall with flammable gas, then set it off. If you could take care of the bombs while the gas concentration is still low. There's a chance we could stop the explosion. Let's do it. Obviously, taking care of those bombs is urgent and all, but I've got a score to settle at high noon. Peace de resistance. <laughs> I'm going to capture on film the exact moment that a human being crosses into zombiehood. Beating Kent's ass is so cathartic. Back to the task at hand, the maintenance tunnels are accessed by a leisure park. They are swarming with zombies, and you have to make your way through to collect all of the bombs. If you're smart, you'll take this motorcycle into the tunnels. If you're stupid, like me, you'll take this car, get it stuck at the bottom of the entryway, and have to navigate the tunnels on foot. Fortunately, you can run while holding onto the comically oversized shopping carts, so that's how I got around. While collecting the bombs, Carlito chases you around in a truck, pelting you with explosives and trying to run you over. When you eventually incapacitate him, a cutscene triggers in which Carlito flees with Brad giving chase. Collect the final bomb and return to the maintenance tunnel entrance for this cutscene. Ugh. 
We got rid of your bombs. This is as far as you go today. Just give up and surrender. <laughs> Bomb's over and done with. Brad went after Carlito. Copy. Report back here, Frank. Yeah. Back to the maintenance tunnels to save Carlito. <sighs> I mean, uh, that meat? Um... Oh, this is good meat, huh? I just got it in here. It's fresh. <laughs> you just wait right there, sir. In a moment, you can try the best ground meat you've ever tasted. Whoa, ground? <laughs> wait a minute, listen. I had something else in mind. Zombies are no good. I can't serve my customers spoiled meat like that. I have a reputation to uphold. <laughs> Trust me, I'm a butcher. I've got the best meat in town. <laughs> There he goes down like a bitch. Isabella. She's on our side now. 
She's checking out your computer right now. My purpose in life has been to get revenge for what you people did to Santa Cabeza, to my hometown. Why? Why was your meat so much more important to you than human life? Why? Why did my people have to die to feed your fat bellies? That doesn't excuse what you've done. I promise, the Santa Cabeza story will be told. But I need the password. Hey. Hey! Hey! Stay with me! Give me the computer's password! Zombies great. I mean, all they do is eat and eat and eat, growing in number, just like you good red, white, and blue Americans. <coughs> Finally, the military arrives in full force. This is a cool stage of the game. The special forces troops eradicate zombies, meaning most of the mall is now littered with corpses. Killing troops grants a ton of prestige, and they go down pretty easily. When 10 a.m. rolls around, another cutscene starts. The military. They'll come, won't they? Just like Santa Cabeza. The government wants to cover this up, too. After this cutscene, you have two in universe hours or 10 real world minutes to get to the helipad. Be there at noon, and as long as you didn't fuck anything up, the following cutscene will play. Oh. <laughs> 
I'll be damned. He's still alive. That son of a bitch made it. <gasps> that must mean he got his scoop. I can't wait to get my share of the take. <laughs> Woo! Yeah! Now, this is the canonical ending, but it's not the only one. Depending on how much Frank manages to accomplish in his three days in the mall, he can face one of six different endings. If you manage the A ending, the summary screen will be followed with another cutscene. This marks the beginning of overtime mode, an additional game mode. You're awake. Oh, thank God. It wasn't easy getting you back here by myself, you know. You collapsed on the roof. I collapsed? No, I... Wait. Does that mean... You... You must have gotten yourself infected somehow. between infection and zombification differs greatly from person to person. You're lucky, Frank. You seem to have a very high level of resistance. So, uh... <laughs> so what you're saying is that I get to spend longer waiting for the inevitable, is that it? <laughs> you know, I'm not sure lucky is the word I'd use. <sighs> the helicopter crashed. No one's coming to help us now.
it's over for us. No matter what we do. There was some way to impede the infection. If we could extract and administer a large dose of hormones from the corpus alatum of an adult queen, it would potentially hinder the growth of the larva in your blood, retarding the zombification process. Hang on a sec. I don't understand a word you just said. What are we supposed to do? I'll need certain supplies to get this to work. And queens. As many as you can get your hands on. All right. Sounds like a plan. Should be sitting around here waiting to die. Outside of the hideout, Frank encounters a special forces drone. I don't remember if they have any offensive capabilities, but they do have an extremely annoying alarm that alerts all nearby special forces to your presence. Collecting the supplies is fairly easy. You can mark each item as your target and then follow your direction arrow to each one. But it makes much more sense to just make a loop around the mall, referring to your map for the location of each item. Now you need to fetch a generator from the clock tower in Leisure Park, and then come back and talk to Isabella. She says that the last thing she needs to create the serum is 10 queens. Much like I have done with this video, this mission is painful length padding. Yeah, fundamentally, this isn't all that different from the last mission where you had to run around the mall collecting miscellaneous garbage, but that one felt believable. This one just doesn't. It feels like a fetch quest. <sighs> Whatever, I'll get them. Bring all 10 queens back to Isabella for another cutscene. You're gonna inject me with that, huh? Okay, Doc. Let's get this over with. <sighs> At least I won't have to worry about turning into one of them for a while. Okay, next on the agenda, figure out a way to get the hell out of here. While I was isolating the hormone, I managed to identify a pheromone that suppresses the attack instinct in adult parasites. In other words, the zombies don't like the way it smells. If you give me a little more time, I should be able to produce some of this pheromone. They think it smells bad? You think we could use something like that to keep them away from us? We could just walk right past them and get out of here. In theory, yes. Either way, it's certainly better than nothing. There was a cave outside where the helicopter crashed. It was packed with zombies, I mean shoulder to shoulder. May lead somewhere outside. If it works, your anti zombie perfume, it could keep us safe in that cave. What do you say? You ready to get the hell out of here? There won't be enough of this pheromone to waste it on experiments. We'll only have enough to use it once. Whatever you say. Considering how many of them keep pouring out of here, it must be connected to something. Isabella, look. 
Any other way out of here is guarded by the military. If we're gonna get out of here and put a stop to Carlito's plan, we've got to go in there. It's the only way. It's not like we're unarmed. We got your smelly perfume, don't we? <sighs> I wouldn't be alive right now if your shot hadn't worked. The perfume's gonna work too. I know it. All right. Let's go. Yeah. So now you're navigating an underground tunnel. If you stay close enough to Isabella, the zombies will avoid you, but if you have the small chainsaw, you really won't care enough to stay close. Reach the end of the tunnel and you'll spot your way out of here, a military vehicle. So, the tank fight is really a nuisance at best. It's not hard, it's not interesting, it's not fun. You shoot the tank. When the health bar is depleted, you get a cutscene. These automated machines are no use at all on the battlefield. Switch to manual control. men mopped up the mall. On a mission in which the number of targets is unclear, it's difficult to ensure absolute thoroughness. Huh. You have imagination. That's what drives you in your quest to run. Your quest to hide as prey. You and your kind are much more stubborn than the zombies. How much do you know about the zombies? I commanded the Santa Cabeza cleanup operation. If we had fulfilled our mission then, we wouldn't be needed here now to take care of this... incident. That's all it was to you, huh? A mission. What about those innocent people who had to pay for sins committed by our government and our its inhuman research? Our mistakes have not begun with this operation. <laughs> Humanity has proven itself to be quite adept at making mistakes. Ha! Hell, it's the only thing we truly excel at. Well then, I'd say this mission isn't quite over yet. Don't you agree? Yeah! Ah! Uh! 
The next fight is a lot more enjoyable. It's just you and Brock, no weapons, 1v1 on Rust. I don't actually know what the intended way to fight Brock is. I just cheese it by attacking him when he's transitioning between levels of the tank. When his health runs out, you get the true final cutscene. Completing overtime mode unlocks the last game mode, infinity mode. Infinity mode has no prescribed goals other than simply surviving. Your health is constantly depleting, food doesn't respawn, and all survivors are hostile. When survivors die, they drop a box containing critical supplies. If you can manage to survive for seven in-game days, you'll unlock the laser sword for future playthroughs of 72 hour mode. The laser sword and the small chainsaw, along with the real mega buster, form the triumvirate of best weapons in the game. The real Mega Buster is unlocked by earning the Zombie Genocider achievement for killing 53,594 zombies, the population of Willamette. Other than these two weapons, there are a number of outfits that can be unlocked by completing various challenges. Nothing worth spending extended time talking about, but they add variety to the game. In summary, Dead Rising is a kick-ass game. In my opinion, one of the best ever made. It is deeply, deeply flawed, but that doesn't modify my opinion at all. I will concede that I think that the sequel is better, but other than that, Dead Rising might be the best zombie game on the market. If you're still with me at this point, you're a trooper. Consider subscribing, consider following me on Twitter, consider whatever, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, thanks for watching.